Good afternoon, folks. It's Dave Burrows. Uh, I'm CIO and CEO here at Barometer Capital Management. And uh, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. Uh, lots to talk about. Uh, widely anticipated earnings coming tomorrow from NVIDIA. We've got the Jackson Hole uh, speeches to be made uh, this week uh, to give us some thoughts from uh, Chair Powell on forward guidance on uh, interest rates and, and what we should expect in rates markets uh, and some of their thoughts. Uh, we're most of the way through earnings, earnings in general coming in a little bit better than expected. Uh, and market, uh, you know, ran up a little bit into earnings, has had some choppiness in the month of August, which is not unexpected given the performance in July. Uh, but lots to look at, and I want to go below the surface, look at some of the big macro picture, uh, and then drive it down into what that means in, in the barometer portfolios. Uh, we try to be transparent on this stuff. Uh, we want people to understand what our thought process is uh, and uh, make sure that we're following the process that we, we say we follow. So just to kick off, uh, starting with equity markets, this is the very long-term picture uh, of the U.S. stock market. You know, we believe we've been in a structural bull market since 2013 when we exceeded the highs from the year 2000. That was a long wait to see that take place. And ultimately, we've been working our way higher in fits and starts since then. Certainly not without interruptions. There's a pretty good one there in 2020 uh, and a pretty good one through 2022. Uh, looking at the last two structural bull markets, uh, you know, we see that we have uh, corrections that last both time, like 1991, which is 18 months before we made a new high, or, or price, you know, pretty big one in 1987. Uh, we've had similar pullbacks through the course of this structural bull market. Uh, 2018 was a tough one because it was a very fast reversal at the very end of the year. Uh, there was a, a good sized one going into COVID. And of course, the market rallied and surprised everybody by finishing up on the year. 2021 ended up being a pretty good year for us. Uh, and of course, 2022, which we fought our way through. And here we are halfway through 2023. We're about 8% uh, off the uh, old high. Uh, it's been going on about 20 months. Uh, and we did come back down, as is customary in a cyclical bear market, touched on the rising 200-week moving average and bounced off it in October and has slowly been grinding higher against a wall of worry. Uh, we've had a very uh, aggressive Fed tightening cycle. We've had a lot of inflation to deal with. Some inflation that came from the supply chain has been coming out. Some inflation from employment has been sticky. And of course, we continue to wonder whether the Fed is done uh, or whether there's more hikes to come. Our view is Fed should be pretty much done, but they're going to continue to talk a tough game because part of their job is to use the bully pulpit to try to get people to recognize that the cost of capital is going up. Um, whether you're a, a purchaser of a new home or whether you're somebody who's taking on leverage to buy a business, uh, they're trying to give some guidance. If we look at the S&P, the bottom uh, so far in this process was October, early October. We've seen a series of higher lows since then. It was our view that that was the low. Uh, and against a lot of worry, the market has been making its way higher, with higher lows consistently. Now, you can see here in the months of June and July, market moved aggressively higher, leaving a couple of gaps behind on the chart. Very often, when you get a gap left in the chart, market will ultimately come back and fill it. We said in the end of July, there is historical precedent for a strong July leading to some correction in August. Uh, the S&P sort of topped to the low as of a couple of days ago is about 5.8% which is typical. We do get to four or five, uh, five percent corrections generally over the course of the year and seasonally this would not be an unusual time for that to happen. The NASDAQ, we talked about the fact it got very extended away from the 150 day moving average and it's pulled back eight percent from top to bottom. A little firmer yesterday, which is good, uh, but again, not an unusual thing to have to have happen. And of course, we got to make sure that we're following process as we go through it. The TSX down about 4.8% in the month of August, but the same as the S&P. Not quite as constructive a chart as the S&P, but 
a series of higher lows, which is what we want to see. Uh, and so corrections come in time and they come in price. They're not easy. There are things to worry about. That's why market's correcting. Uh, but we need to see this process take place and we continue to be quite constructive as the year goes on. Uh, across our portfolios, we pulled back a little bit in the month of August. Our equity portfolio is down about 4.3%. Uh, we're not unhappy with that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's typical to have, you know, three, four, five percent corrections over the course of the year, maybe a 10 percent are out there somewhere. Our guess is we don't see another 15 percent correction for some time. Last year being a, a, a great shakeout, I put a lot of people on the sidelines and has left a lot of people underinvested here as we're going through this year. Outside of the U.S., you know, there are some good results coming from global markets. Japan, after, you know, a very long time, a 30-year bear market, has been working its way higher. This is a currency hedged ETF, DXJ. Uh, it's quite uh, well known that Warren Buffett's been an active buyer of Japanese stocks, feeling that there's good value there. They're getting some inflation in the system for the first time in many, many years after, after trying to, to get some inflation. Uh, India has been performing quite well, minimal pullback in the month of August. Uh, Mexico behaving quite well, having come out of a multi-year bear market, very minor pullback into the moving averages coming out of coming into August. So global, some global markets, you know, continue to act quite well. So equities overall continue to be in a structural bull market. We're working our way through this cyclical bear market, uh, but we believe that we saw the worst of it. Uh, and we have sort of what comes next, which is two to three years of higher prices. When we look at fixed income, it's a different story. We had a tailwind in the bond market from 1981 through 2020, falling interest rates. So if you get falling interest rates in the bond market over a long period of time, you not only get your coupon, but you get some capital appreciation, which is why so many people love the bond market after 40 years of falling rates. I thought it was entertaining today to hear uh, Fed Governor Dudley make the comment that there's a good chance that the bull market in bonds that started in 1981 is over. Well, we've been talking about this now for about 18 months and, and clearly it is. Bond prices have been very, very weak. And when we look at what people have been doing, it's interesting, you, you see how people invest based on the way that they feel. We look at the fact that uh, 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 asset managers and private investors have been buying the bond market, lots of money going in. On the other side, hedge funds in general have been short the bond market. And we've been fairly vocal about being short the long end of the bond market. We've used some short-term bonds just as a place to hold cash, uh, but it's been pretty ugly. And, and I guess the reason is that investors believe that rates are likely to move lower. The percent expecting lower long-term rates has probably never been higher since the year 2000. Yet that's not the way it's working out. Uh, the aggregate bond index, which is made up of various issuers and maturities and credit qualities, has been working its way lower since midway through 2020. We bottomed <clears throat> in September of last year. The bond market bounced a little at the end of the year into these declining moving averages. And over the last few weeks has sold off quite sharply. So <clears throat> if we look at it year to date, the aggregate bond index is down about 5% after long end of the bond market being down 21% last year. So, so sorry, the aggregate bond index being down 21% last year. So this is a continuation of a bond bear market. And maybe it will be that we'll retest these lows and get a bounce off them. I'm not making that bet. When we look at the TLT, the long bond ETF, it's down 13% year to date. So this the bond market has been a tough place to be and, and a place that we've been trying to avoid. TLT down 48% since the beginning of the bear market. So all that money piling into bonds, and I've got lots of questions from people saying, boy, you know what you think? you know, 5% or 4% sounds pretty good. Uh, well, it isn't if you're losing capital at the same time. So good reason for that, you know, public debt continues to 
continues to rise sharply. There's been a ton of issuance since the debt ceiling was passed. We know that U.S. government spending uh, over the next uh, 10 years is on par with what we saw in World War II. Uh, and we know the strain that that put on the system. <clears throat> Yet people continue to buy bonds and put money into cash. And while equities rise, very little new money going in. So we think that investors in general are mismatched against the market. If we look at things the other way, mortgage rates, mortgage rates as of the end of last month were seven and a half percent in the US on a 30 year mortgage. They're now pushing 8%. We haven't seen that in 25 years. So that has an effect. And we believe that we've gone from a world where the borrower is in control, people who use debt to buy businesses or buy real estate or to make investments to a world where the lender is in control. And that changes the types of things that do well. We need to own things that generate a lot of cash that don't need debt. We need to own companies that can raise their dividends. And we need companies that can set price. Companies that have used debts to ratchet up the returns <clears throat> on a thin slice of equity, we think will have difficulty going forward. Now, the good news is in the short run, government deficit spending is helping offset the impact of higher rates. But those assets that require lots of debt are under pressure. What we can say is stocks versus bonds. So the SPY spider versus TLT is in favor of stocks. <clears throat> so we believe stocks a better asset class to focus on than bonds, despite the fact that there's you know, things that we have to worry about in the stock market, the bond market is worse. When we look within the stock market, dividend growth securities, as represented by RDVY ETF, which is made up of companies that have had a history of strong dividend growth relative to bonds also is outperforming. So from an income perspective, we believe we're better off owning equities that have a propensity to be able to raise their dividends. The income portfolio can be in bonds, it can be in cash, it can be in dividend paying equities. We are focused in dividend paying equities. <clears throat> and while the bond market has been going through its last little shakedown over the last few weeks, you know, we're pleased income portfolios off 1.5% against the stock market down between four and eight and a bond market down between five and 13. So we think dividend growth provides resilience. To put a point on it, if we take all of the holdings in our income portfolio, the dividend yield is about 2.6% versus the S&P benchmark at about 1.9. So a little higher dividend, but most importantly, very high dividend growth. So the average company in our portfolios had 15% dividend growth per year over the last five years about the same over the last three years, and one year growth rate of a little over 20%, which we think helps immune, immunize us against some of the effects of inflation. In the equity portfolio, equity portfolio has about the same volatility as stocks, but again, very high dividend growth, three-year dividend growth rate of around 20, and one-year dividend growth rate around 18, sorry, 19%. So the goal here is to make sure we're getting total return, make sure we're getting a rising stream of income, make sure that we have companies that have an ability to pay us. And you can see our portfolio average holding is only paying out 22% of their earnings versus the S&P paying out 38% of their earnings. So low dividend payout with high dividend growth is a really attractive combination, we think, in a rising rate environment. Let's move on. Let's talk about commodities for a moment. Commodity bear market from 2008 through 2020 makes a lot of commodities haters. I understand that. But when rates started to rise, so did commodity prices. And we had a sharp rise in the broad-based commodity index until April of 22, four months into the stock bear market, commodity prices were still headed higher. Then we had a very, very aggressive Fed tightening cycle. Now, if you were looking for an economically sensitive asset, that you would expect to do poorly if rates ratcheted sharply higher, it would be commodities. But in fact, commodities held in quite well through the course of that 
tightening cycle. And I mentioned a couple of months ago, very interesting to see commodities now starting to reaccelerate upward as the market's starting to believe that the Fed may be done with its tightening cycle. We think this was the first leg of what will be a multi-year bull market in commodity prices, which means for commodity producers, rising cash flow, rising ability to pay a dividend, rising ability to pay down debt, and rising ability to make acquisitions. Now, it's begun, but when it begins, outperformance versus stocks tends to go on for a long period of time. So while these tend to be small parts of the market, we think that they can give us outsized returns and give us an opportunity to really generate some excess return over the next several years. But most investors don't believe that. Through the Fed tightening cycle, they became very underweight commodities. And we think that provides opportunity because ultimately we think investors are gonna to wanna to build positions here. If we compare commodities versus bonds, outperformance through 2021, 2020 and 21, sideways performance against the bear market and a reacceleration in the last two months. If we look at commodities versus, sorry, this is mis mislabeled, the equal weight S&P or RSP, which is an equally weighted basket of the 500 companies in the S&P, under performance to 2021, beginning of outperformance sideways through the bear market and stocks and look, reaccelerating versus stocks. So from an asset class perspective, we like equities. For the first time in many years, we like global equities. And for the first time in many years, we like basic materials and commodities and commodities producers. Of these asset classes, the worst one is the bond market. And that's one that we're being very careful with. Okay, look, we don't have to be everywhere. Our job is to pick our spots and then make sure that the evidence continues to support our positioning. We don't wanna be everywhere, we wanna be in market leading sectors, places where multiples are expanding and money is being put to work. We wanna always watch for change, which is one of the reasons we do these presentations to show what we are doing to deal with change and have an ability to play defense when there's no opportunity to put new money to work. So it is a tactical approach. And the top-down model gives us a whole bunch of neighborhoods that we could focus in, but we use our breadth-based models to identify sectors that we think are seeing net inflows of capital, and we wanna focus in those areas. A huge percent of return comes from getting to the right neighborhood. From a bottom-up perspective, we wanna find securities to express that view with, and we want to find specific securities that have characteristics that point to positive change, where we can find securities that are good getting better. And there's about 20 factors that we look for in the income statement, the balance sheet. And of course, we look for relative strength from a price perspective. And that's where our portfolio should live. And that's a dynamic neighborhood. So the breadth models help us to identify sectors where over time more and more securities are participating in a rally, that's healthy. When breadth is narrowing or the weaklings start to fall away, no matter what the leaders are doing, that tells us we shouldn't put on new positions. It tells us we should say tighten our stops and maybe we'll wanna raise a little bit of cash. So that's a segue into sort of the current world because we're in one of those times when we have to be a little bit more defensive. Now, as of July, all of our breadth-based models were positive, and we know market rallied nicely from the end of March through the end of July. In the last webcast I did two weeks ago, we highlighted that some of our short-term models had turned more cautious, and so it was possible we could get some bumpiness in the month of August. When we look at where we are today, Further evidence, because for instance, the percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving average has come down from 80% to about 30%. The percent of stocks in uptrends has moved from about 53% to about 43% or about 10% of stocks on the NYSE have given sell signals. And our other short term indicators have weakened as well. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that we examine the positions that we own to be critical to make sure we know where we would sell them if they aren't working. And the good news is 
most of our positions have continued to be very constructive. So let's just talk about leadership for a minute. Let's go right off the top to where we were on August the 7th. We highlighted that, interestingly, the weakest groups in the market were the most defensive. Drugs, telecom, electric utilities. Okay? These are supposed to be the defensive parts of the market we want to own if you're concerned about recession. But they were behaving poorly, just like the bond market. On the other end of the spectrum, the more economically sensitive groups had a higher percentage of stocks and uptrends. And we were noting that despite some concerns about the bond market, these things were acting quite well. We also noted that technology, software, and semiconductors had reversed down and gave us some cause for some caution. So what's happened since then? Relative strength for technology that had been rising sharply through the early part of the year until May, then went flat and started to back off. We broke the 50-day moving average, and that's resulted top to bottom in about a 9% pullback. Now, a lot's going to depend on how NVIDIA reports tomorrow. But it's not to be sneezed at when an important group in the market, which makes up 30% of the S&P, breaks the 50-day and has its first significant pullback within an uptrend. We talked about some of the core holdings that we've had, and we had an underweight position coming into the beginning of August, about 21% in technology. Since then, we've exited two positions. AMD and Shopify. Palo Alto blew the doors off earnings early this week, had a 15% up week. And in general, the positions have been acting well. We'll see how NVIDIA behaves tomorrow. Although we did trim it, it had become about a 6% weight in most portfolios, trimmed it back to sort of 4.5% weights because it's done so well. Things that have not been doing well. Utilities. Consistently relative strength losers. Staples, relative strength losers. REITs, relative strength losers. Now, these groups have been small positions in our portfolios all year long. But utilities, which were a half of 1%, were actually net short today. Real estate, which was an underweight at 1.5%, is basically gone from the portfolio. Consumer staples, which was 1.6%, basically gone from the portfolio. So the defensive sectors have become an even smaller piece. At the upper end of the portfolio, technology, which was 21%, as I mentioned, we cut two positions, we're down at 16% versus 28% in the S&P. Our cash and short-term bond positions went higher. The most accounts have between 12 and 15% cash. But energy continues to rise. Now, part of that's organic, and part of it is that this group just continues to look favorable. This is the XEG ETF, which is the Canadian Oil Producers ETF. After a bear market that went 2014 through 2021 broke out, consolidated through the Fed tightening cycle, but look at over the last few weeks, how it's lifted out of that consolidation. That's against a weak stock market. Energy versus large cap growth, XLE, which is the ETF that owns a broad base of commodity producers in energy versus IWF, the large cap growth ETF, is making a new three month high on a relative basis. Remember, we don't have to be everywhere. We want to target relative strength. Let's look at it another way. If we take all of the sectors in blue, we're highlighting what percent of stocks are trading above their 200 day moving average. So the two strongest here would be tech and energy, followed by industrials. But then in red, we highlight what the percentage of stocks trading above the 50 day moving average. So in energy, 96% of stocks above the 50 day, that's a short term moving average, a short term indicator of trend. We're in tech. It's pulled back significantly so that now only 28% of stocks are trading above their 50-day. So there's relative weakness. That means we should have relatively less exposure. Now, as I say, a lot's going to depend on how NVIDIA reports tomorrow night and more importantly, how the market reacts. But I would say the market internals in the tech sector, especially for the high multiple stocks, has weakened. ARC ETF, 
is down 20% over the last four weeks. This is the unprofitable part of tech or earlier stage. So what is working? Energy, right? This is CNQ. And we talked about Canadian Natural Resources as one that has gone sideways over the course of just about 14 years, broke out to a new high, and is now exiting that consolidation. Well, why would this be attractive? Well, because they've paid down debt to levels that they are very comfortable with and there's a low level of leverage. So what are they going to do with the capital going forward? They're going to raise their dividend. They're going to buy back shares. Pays a 4.5% yield, and the dividend is growing at north of 30% a year and likely is going to continue to be very strong. In the last bull market for energy, Canadian Natural Resources went up by 1,700%. It's why it's important when we see these structural changes take place that we get positioned in sectors that have been out of favor for a long time because they can really move as people slowly rebuild positions. Imperial oil, 3.5% yield dividend growing at 18% looks a lot like CNQ. Now we've talked about tourmaline, we've talked about Paramount, we've talked about <clears throat> white cap, we've talked about Hess. We do have a number of positions here. We're careful with diversification. We also have the uh, service sector, uh, we talked about, as I mentioned, talked about tourmaline, precision drilling, uh, and tri-can well services, both doing well. The relative strength lines just continue to improve. So I find this very, very promising. When groups behave well through a pullback in the market, it generally means when the pullback ends, they outperform. So good broad base of energy holdings across the portfolios. Materials down 3.9%. This is typically a group that has higher volatility than the stock market, but has had less volatility going through this pullback. If we look at the look at some of the leaders like Tech Resources, holding a nice uptrend, uh, Cameco has come out of this long bear market very, very effectively the last three months moving smartly higher. Again, the beginning of a longer term move. And the steel ETF, again, a group that you would expect to get hurt badly with sharply higher rates and concerns about recession, but really trading just off the highs. So I think that these themes continue to be tested effectively. The home builders continue to act well, although we did reduce one position, Century Communities. We do worry about the impact of high rates, even though the companies are acting well and there's a lack of new homes on the market. The defense sector continues to behave well, manufacturing stocks particularly well, and as we mentioned, transportation and materials. Last couple of things. While the healthcare sector has been sloppy, Lilly has been a star. I give Jim Skatakis great kudos for putting us into Lilly with the belief that the weight, uh, weight loss drugs give a great uh, long runway for these companies. Uh, we've had a very sizable move, but against the tough market, just continues to move higher. We also own Weight Watchers in this group. So when you look at the dark blue periods, the corrections don't look very big and the worries don't look very big, but it doesn't mean they're not there. We worry like everybody else that the Fed will overdo it. We worry about geopolitics. We worry about inflation. And we worry about homeowners. But the fact is that the equity asset class is acting well. Breadth has broadened into other global markets. Commodities that are highly economically sensitive are behaving constructively. And the companies that produce them are outperforming the market. So a year ago, we put this up. As of September of last year, the market was down 25.9%. And we looked at the worst nine-month periods and what might come following them. So when we looked out, we said over three-month periods, there were lots of times when things got worse. It looked to us like we were getting towards a bottom. If we looked out six months, and now remember, we're going back a long way here, there were a few negative components. One year out, there was one year where it was down 13%. Now, as it looks like now, we're about you know two weeks from the end of August. Uh, we're gonna be into September and we're into this one year period. 
and markets are smartly higher. Doesn't mean we're not going to have seasonally bumpy markets like we tend to do in August and September. But when we look at the groups that we're focused on, they continue to behave very constructively, which means if the pressure comes off, they move higher. So we do have catalysts. We're going to get news from the Fed this week. We're going to get, you know, companies starting to talk a little bit more about their next quarter as they come out of the quiet period. Um, we're going to have a few more earnings reports, which we're going to watch. My guess is in the near term, we bounce, and then we'll see how September goes. But I'm pleased the way the portfolios are holding up, despite the fact it's been a bumpy month in August. Uh, and we'll continue to be vigilant and use the stops where it's required. But the reason we're here is not for what happens during these blue boxes. It's for what comes in the two and three years following the blue boxes that matters. And if we can get through and into new highs, which I think we can do probably by the end of the year, we have a long runway in front of us to generate returns. And we think dividend growth and companies that have an ability to set price will be able to offset inflation. So if things get worse, we'll get more defensive. That's what we do. Uh, but our view is that uh, that things look good towards year end. So with that, I'm going to see if there's any questions. I don't have Pamela, my moderator, here with me today, but let's just have a quick look. Okay, uh, a question from Steve. I see the home builder sector doing very well in the USA, but the lumber sector is still in the woodshed. How can we explain that? Well, I think the issue for the home builders in the US is that, <clears throat> first of all, the, the rate of production is still relatively low compared to where we were, say, in 2007. But there's not a lot of existing homes coming on the market. The biggest issue is that most people in the U.S. have a 30-year mortgage. And if you got a 30-year mortgage at 3%, the idea of trading your home and taking a new mortgage at 7 or 8% is pretty unappetizing. So as a result, there's not a lot of existing homes coming on the market. There's just a shortage of new homes. And so the new home uh, um, uh, sellers are in control on that one. In Canada, you can take your mortgage and port it to the next property. Of course, in the U.S., you can't. So I think that that's the, the biggest issue. Question here on, uh, on Gunner. Uh, GUNR is an ETF that owns commodity producers and dividend payers. Um, this is uh, down a little over the course of the last year. Uh, and the question is, you know, what's the outlook going forward? You know, consider the fact that we had a very, very aggressive Fed tightening cycle. Earlier in the, in the discussion, we looked at what commodity prices did through the course of that period of time. They came down a little bit. Now, keep in mind, over the course of the, of the year last year, you know, tech came down 30 percent. Uh, unprofitable tech came down close to 80. S&P at the worst point was down 25. These things are now relatively outperforming the stock market. Uh, I think that that's an excellent ETF to own for the dividends that it's going to pay. It's got good dividend growth <clears throat> uh, and the yield is way higher than the S&P. Uh, these are going to be cash flow generating machines. And I think that these are, uh, it's a good basket to focus in. And I think that that's it. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, you know, August is supposed to be kind of a sloppy month because lots of people are away on vacation. So markets trade a little bit wider, a little bit looser. Uh, we always, of course, are interested to see how people feel coming back in September. We're going to watch the progression as we go along. If you've got questions or things you'd like to talk about that we didn't address today, please don't hesitate to give us a call or send us an email. If you've got things that you would like us to touch on in, in future webcasts, please uh, make sure you pass them on to us. And uh, otherwise, enjoy your August. And we look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday. Bye, folks.